Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now what we have here is an Intel Core i3 6100 processor. Popular among budget builders in 2015, this CPU features two cores, four threads and integrated HD530 graphics. I wish I could say that it represents great value for money in 2020, but here in the UK at least it still retails used for about £50, which is more than you could find a second hand and closely performing Ryzen 3 1200 for. We're off to a great start. So, does this hyper-threaded dual core have what it takes to handle games in 2020? And should you buy one? Let's talk about the full setup. Alongside the 3.7GHz 6th Gen Skylake i3, we have a cheap Gigabyte H110 D3A motherboard. Intended for miners, they can be picked up for a very reasonable price these days and are perfectly suitable for an entry-level gaming build. To go with these two, we have an Arctic Alpine 12 cooler which is a very cheap aftermarket solution and perfect for when you buy a second-hand processor that doesn't come with an Intel stock one, a seemingly common occurrence. Finally, we also have the usual suspects, the Radeon 5700 XT and 16 gigs of DDR4, which in this case will be limited to 2133 MHz. While the 5700 XT should not be paired with the i3-6100 in the real world, it does mean that the processor will be able to reach its maximum potential and show us what it's really capable of. Unfortunately, I had to reinstall everything on my PC not long ago, including the operating system, so I'm slowly building my game's collection back up and even adding some more into the mix. I've got six tantalising titles to check out in today's video, so let's kick things off with Fallout 4. It is an older game, but it's one that released in the same year as the i3-6100, so where better place to start than here? The game is capped at 60 FPS and this is for the sake of the game engine which may exhibit strange behaviour otherwise. So this first benchmark was more about seeing how well the CPU helped maintain a solid average and whether or not it can keep us close to or on the capped figure. Annoyingly, 59 FPS was the average which I suppose we'll have to do. Seriously, it feels great, and there are a couple of dips here and there, don't get me wrong, but you'll notice from the figures in the top left corner that the CPU isn't really struggling much at all, and back in 2015, this was an ideal chip for tackling the vast open world that Fallout 4 takes place in. Another example of a game that runs just fine is Counter-Strike Global Offensive, which is more popular than ever and definitely worth a place in the benchmark lineup. It's CPU intensive, but despite this, the i3 handles it just fine at 1080p. I tend to run this at the lowest settings, ever since a few of you said that this is how you play, and by doing this we saw just shy of 120 frames per second. The footage that I recorded is from a bot match, so as not to hinder my teammates by focusing more on recording than actually playing, but the frame rate test was performed during a match on Dust 2 using Fraps. The Far Cry 5 results seemed great at first, and according to the benchmark, we were averaging a cheeky 69 FPS at 1080p normal, but when it came to actual gameplay, this average was closer to 50 in busier or built up areas. So I've put the gameplay average on screen instead of the benchmark figure and here you can also see that the CPU is being put under some serious strain. It is remaining very cool which is nice to see though so our Arctic 12 cooler seems to be doing a great job. It's also very quiet. I know this isn't a cooler review but this one does seem to be quite good which I wasn't expecting. I bought it because it cost me a fiver on Amazon with same day delivery. On the surface, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds seems to run okay with a decent looking frame rate on screen, right? Well, the trouble is that the processor again seems to be having a pretty hard time, and in turn we'll see some dips here and there, which can really be off-putting. The average came in at over 60 FPS, but the 1% and 0.1% lows do leave something to be desired. I'll have to see how other Skylake CPUs fare these days at some point because as I recall, I haven't had much experience with the i5s or i7s from this architecture, if any. 
They seem pretty boring to me at the time they came out, if I'm honest, and it seems they are now overpriced in a lot of places, at least here in the UK, so that's probably why I haven't really checked them out. Okay, so next up it's my current favourite game, The Outer Worlds. Because I'm an absolute genius, I accidentally left the MSI overlay over the HUD in the top left corner, so it is a bit of a mess, but hopefully you can still make everything out. The CPU does reach 100% usage at some points, usually when there are a few enemies on screen or when we approach a new area. But I tend to notice stutter a lot of the time here anyway, unless we cap the game. The different locations will also have different impacts on the frame rate, which could apply to any game, but the difference between towns and uh, not towns seems quite noticeable, especially here. So bear that in mind if you want to pick this up. I have it on Game Pass for PC, which honestly as a service seems really good so far, even if the MS Store isn't without its issues. Okay, so now it's Red Dead Redemption 2. I ran the in-game benchmark, which takes place across a few different environments, and the average turned out to be spot on 60. This was with the first balanced preset, the one you see here, with nothing else changed or turned off. I find this to be an ideal go-to preset if I want decent performance and fairly good visuals. Again, it's a two-core, four-threaded CPU we have here, so expect some drops to the low or mid-30s under intensive circumstances. Like any gameplay that takes place in Saint-Denis, for example, but as you wander off into empty expanses or marshlands, the frame rate will really improve, hence the decent overall average. If you were to exclusively spend your time in town, which is highly unlikely, then you'd be seeing closer to 45-ish with a Skylake i3 and a 5700 XT, which I'd like to reiterate isn't a combination that you should be considering. And if you have an i3 already, well, it may be time to upgrade, though, there are still a few instances whereby it can handle itself fairly well. Finally, I quickly tested Forza Horizon 4, the demo of the game that is. I wasn't sure if this was going to be finished by the time that I actually uploaded this, so this was a bit of an afterthought. I've been downloading it all day, again on my awful internet, but uh, yeah, it seems to run pretty well. It's a very well optimised game, or at least I've found, and it still looks fantastic as well even if we do have to turn the settings down a little bit. Forza Horizon 4 is one of those games that looks great on any setting, to be honest, and the vast open world certainly is a lot of fun to drive around, even with the i3-6100 in the system. I'm sure the 16 gigs of RAM helped a lot, though. And if you were to put together a budget system with this at the heart of it, well you might also be considering 8 gigs of RAM, which should also do an okay job. 8 gigs is probably the minimum you'd want to think about these days, and 16 gigs tends to be the sweet spot. Alright, so we may as well talk about the processing power itself when it comes to CPU-intensive tasks. First of all, Cinebench R20 scored 982 in the multi-core test. This is similar to what you might expect from an overclocked Athlon 3000G. Yeah, it's not too bad from the i3. It will do okay in day-to-day -day tasks. And as you can see, gaming. When it comes to editing, I fired up Premiere Pro and it was a bit of a mess as far as video playback was concerned. The CPU struggled even with the video resolution in the preview window set to one quarter. This really isn't a very good CPU for editing though, Having said that, I did then install an older version of Premiere Pro, CC 2015, the version that I've spent most of my time with, and that performed a lot better. In fact, the video preview playback was flawless, so it may just be this latest version of the software, which I have noticed does struggle to play back smoothly, even with my Ryzen 5 1600 AF at times, so... Bear that in mind. It's okay, you can get away with editing on a chip like this. It just won't be as good as, say, something that has four physical cores or more. With all that said and done, I hope you've enjoyed a look back at the i3-6100. I've certainly had a great time messing around with it. If you did, leave a like on this video below. Leave a dislike below if you didn't enjoy the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And in the next one, we'll be gaming at 480p. That's right. 
<laughs> so expect some interesting content there to say the least. Thank you and goodbye.